Argentina. Um, I have been um, coaching and working in many places in the world. And uh, well, I'm one of the FIH Academy educators. I got my degree in 2017 in Lancaster for the during the Pan American Cup. And with many of the other educators, we are doing these webinars for the Pan Am Hockey Federations, which I think that at this time, uh, the times that we're living currently is one of is, is a great tool to, to try to share the knowledge. Now, one of the things that we are taught in the academy is to change the way we communicate, especially with these sessions and during training sessions. So I would not like to do out of this a monologue when I'm the only one speaking for one hour, one hour and a half, because I know I'm going to get you guys bored and I'm going to bore myself as well. So I will try to do this very interactive. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up on a few parts of the presentation to do some questions. Actually, I'm going to ask you the questions and perhaps I'm going to call you by name. Uh, there's some people on the list that I know you know, that I know in advance. So I'm going to try to call you and you just give uh, your opinion. This is this is not going to be a classroom session. I would like to do to do this more of a, a hockey conversation. So that's what I'm going to do. Just be ready. If I ask you something, just open up your microphone. This is not an examination. This is to share the knowledge, to share your opinions as well. And that way it's going to be more entertaining. So the topic of today is plan and execute dynamic training sessions. Now, this is not going to be a session about this is the way we have to do things in terms of do this drill or do this other drill. No, this is going to be more of a conversation that can be applied to hockey. It can be applied to other sports. It can be applied even in your workspace if you do some work outside hockey. So these are three of the things that I wrote down here, in my opinion. Again, this is just my opinion to start with, that a training session should have, which is intensity, dynamic flow, and concentration. Now, this doesn't mean, in terms of intensity, that the players need to be running 100 miles per hour every single second. It's not about that. What I mean here with intensity, dynamic flow, and concentration is that us, as coaches, we need to try to generate training sessions through drills that generate tension on the player to make them have intensity, dynamic flow, and concentration. We have a very intense sport in terms of speed, which also requires that we are focused and concentrated all the time, which also requires that we are under a constant tension about what's going to happen and a lot of pressure throughout during the game. Therefore, if our training sessions do not include these uh, subjects, we're going to be training a team that is not going to be able to perform under those circumstances during the game. We're going to start describing a law that is more of a business law. It's called Little's Law, which is a law that provides a simple and intuitive approach for the assessment of the efficiency of queuing systems. This law basically tells you how efficient a process runs, efficient in terms of time, of flow. I'm going to explain this easily. Let's say that we have a water tank that has a capacity of 1,000 gallons. There is an input that fills 10 gallons per minute of water and an output that delivers 10 gallons per minute as well. Therefore, the process between 10 gallons go in until they go out is 10, sorry, is 100 minutes. Once again, this is a very linear example on a perfect example. I mean, there's no external variables. We have 10 gallons going in per minute, 10 gallons coming out, and there's a capacity of 1,000 gallons. Therefore, every time that 10 gallons go in, they take 100 minutes to go out. It's perhaps the most well-known law to learn about the performance of a system. Again, this water thing being a system. Sorry, I'm going to make a pause. Laura, do you hear me well? Just in case last time we had a, a issue with the with the audio. Everything is going well? Oh, you're okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, good. 
let me go back again so again this is a system that has no external variables everything is going in a perfect in a perfect environment 1000 gallons 10 go in 10 go out 100 minutes process so again this law tells us about the performance and the efficiency of a system that being a system so how can we apply this to hockey to our sport through this simple law we can basically know how long does a player take back to get into action to in a drill doesn't matter what drill we do we're going to show a very simple model of a drill and we need to determine how long it takes for one player to get into action once again instead of standing in line additionally we're going to take under consideration how long does the action period last during a drill what I call by action period is executing the drill I'm going to put in a simpler example let's say we're just doing a shooting exercise it doesn't matter what if it includes dribbling through cones making 3d skills it's just one line, somebody collects a ball, takes a shot at goal, goes back to the line. So the input, in this case, would be the player returning to the line. The line is the water tank, the line of players. We have five players waiting in line, that is the, the, the capacity of the water tank, to put it somehow. And the output is the player collecting the ball, doing the exercise, taking the shot at uh, the goal. That will be the action time. So with this we can say, okay, what is the individual waiting time? Meaning, how long does each individual need to wait until advancing to a new position? How long will be the total waiting time? How long that individual will wait until they get back into the action, they collect back the ball and execute the drill? How long does it last the action time? And finally, what is, how long is the dead time? The dead time, I mean, the external variables, for example, the coach has to stop the exercise and give an explanation. The coach perhaps uh, forgot the balls, and instead of having 100 balls, he has 10 balls. So until the ball goes out and they have to collect the balls again, it's a dead time that they are not even, they are not either waiting in line to start the exercise or they are not even executing the exercise. So if we add the action time that the exercise lasts, meaning from the moment that the player collects the ball and takes the shot, plus the dead time, again, that could be the external variables, we can have the individual waiting time, how long each individual will wait in each position. If additionally, we multiply the individual waiting time by the amount of players in line or in the exercise, we will have the total waiting time. If I'm going too fast, please uh, write down on the chat any questions that you have and I will be happy to to repeat so if you have any questions on this no problem we're not rushing so we can you can ask me any questions but I go again the individual waiting time by the amount of players in line we will have the total waiting time of an exercise now this of course is not perfect as the model of the water tank that I show you because one player can take longer to execute the exercise. The, I don't know, the, the, there might be more players or, or the player might take longer to return to the line. It doesn't matter, but it gives us an estimate on how dynamic and intense an exercise can be. Again, it can be a line with shooting at goal or it can be something else. I'm going to show an example, very simple, again, with a similar a very similar uh, model of exercise, which is nothing out of this world, it's something very simple. Let me share my other screen. Here we go. So, Laura, can you see this? Yes. Are you guys? Uh, okay, okay, I just want to make sure that I have the video on screen. Yeah. So, this is a very simple exercise, just a player drilling through the cones, turning around, passing the ball back to the line, and starting over the exercise. So, we're going to start from this player that is collecting the ball. We have four players waiting, one player executing the drill. So, one, two, three, 
four seconds it took her for executing what the drill was um, demanding from them. And now she has to turn around and pass the ball. We're going to call that the dead time. I don't know what's happening on the other side of the screen. It doesn't matter. Let's say that she had to turn around and pass the ball back to a line. Probably she will not pass it on target. It doesn't matter. So we have, let's say, five seconds it took her to do this drill. Now she's turning around again. She's turning back. I don't know where the ball is. That is all the dead time. I know, let's say she took another five seconds. So she goes again. Another one goes in. So what do we have here? We have that in average they take to execute the drill between four seconds to five seconds. Let's call it five. Let's say that until the ball returns, which I know looks longer than actually it is, let's say that's another five seconds. And we have five players executing this exercise. So Go back to the PowerPoint. So I told you before that the action time here was five seconds. The dead time was another five seconds. Therefore, the individual waiting time is 10 seconds. We had back then four players waiting in line and one executing the exercise. Therefore, the conclusion from these numbers basically are that each player had to wait 10 seconds in each position of the line and in total they waited 50 seconds until they were back again into the exercise. As a matter of fact, sorry, 40 because there was one player less than the example that I'm giving you here. The output and the input was the same player. What I mean by this? They had to wait 40 seconds to play 10 seconds. If you extend that to a more complex situation or exercise, the number of waiting time and the action time is so far from each other that makes the motion of the, the flow of the training session extremely slow. Let's go with this example again, similar example. Let's say that the action time was 10 seconds. Therefore, with all these players running in this exercise, we have a waiting time of 50 seconds. Let's say that the coach said, you know what? We're going to run this exercise for 10 minutes because the coach plan ahead that they're going to do this exercise for 10 minutes. If you extend this in time, the players might have been waiting for 8 minutes and a half and they were playing for 1 minute and 30 seconds. Now sometimes we plan an exercise and we don't realize that this is happening. Sometimes we just do the exercise and we say in our head, you know what, it's going to flow well. I think in my head, you know, having six players doing the exercise, just reeling around, returning to a line, you know, it's going to go well. Good, it could be. But if you put it in numbers, how can we go for 10 minutes with 18 minutes, eight minutes and a half in a waiting period while just one minute and 30 seconds of playing is too much. And it happens to us in many, many exercises, not in this simple exercise. Now, I show you this example. I'm going to show you another example. Here. This is an exercise that I don't think the, the intention is bad. It's a rebound on the net, the crazy catch, they collect the ball and they shoot. But again, take under consideration what I told you before. So we make this mistake a lot when we're training kids and we do it as well when we are coaching premier players. Or actually, most of you, are, I'm sure that you were play hockey players. How many times, think, think as a player, how many times you face exercises that you were standing in line or you were just waiting outside for the exercise to be executed and you were standing there and then you were able to collect the ball, play, and it was only, there you have an example, two seconds. One, two, three. That's it. And now, back in line, not only to wait for the five players that are on the left side of the screen, but also on the four players that are on the other side of the screen. So the action time is so little compared to the amount of time that they have to wait. And the worst part of this is that if you multiply this for the amount of minutes that a training session should, can last, for the amount of minutes that you're going to run the exercise for, 
the amount of time that the players have the ball in their stick is too little. So now I'm going to, I spoke for a while, I would like to open up a little bit the questions. And I see in the list, Juane, are you there? Yes. Juane Garreta, how are you? Fine, you? Good, good. A long time friend and rival as well for me. Yeah. <laughs> how are you doing? Good, good. Uh, the question that I would like to ask you to start, and then I'm going to ask for the other ones, is what is your experience in terms of this, of exercise? And I know that I'm showing a very simple exercise with kids, but as a player, did you experience exercise or training sessions that you were saying, this is low, this is going, I feel like I'm not doing much? Yeah, for sure. And uh, I had the, the experience as a player, and I have already the experience as a trainer and coach right now so uh, it's a situation that we 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 live every week or in the pitch with kids and my question to you and to everybody is what happens with the players that are waiting in line while the equal what do they do what do the players generally do when they're waiting in line they are not concentrate they lose yes. the the um, the rhythm of the training. They they lose the 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 objective. Right. Yes. So that that is exactly that. So the players lose the concentration. They lose the focus, and then the objective of the exercise doesn't go well because they didn't have enough time to execute or to at least to to experiment to experience what the exercise was supposed to do, and. Let's see, Steven, how are you? Uh, hi, I'm fine, thanks. That, did it happen to you? Did you see it? Did you experience it as a player, as a coach? Uh, yeah, as a coach, um, I would see this quite a lot, especially in, in youth coaching, um, where there's a lot of exercises uh, attacking the circle when children would be, be lined up, mm -hmm. uh, usually in larger numbers. Right, and, and here's my question. What is our reaction generally as coaches? What do we do when that happens? Uh, for me, sometimes if we can uh, cut down the numbers of children doing that exercise, so they're they're getting more turns at taking at taking part in the exercise. Um, right. Split exercises up so you've got different stations where children are are not all working at that one station, um, so they're more active. Good, good. That's a solution. Uh, Jennifer, Jennifer, are you there? I don't think she's there. Okay, let me see. Okay, what I would like to ask anybody, just open up your microphone and, and go ahead. Um, doesn't it happen sometimes that when we have this situation, and perhaps, like Stephen said, we, we split the exercise, good, but sometimes we don't do it because we're cutting the motion of the exercise and we see the players talking and we turn to the players and like, guys, you are not concentrated. Come on. Does it happen sometimes? David, Joshua? Yes, yeah, hi, Pablo. Um, yeah, yeah. Always, it, it happens. It happens often. And I think particularly I find when we are doing, let's for argument, take a build-up exercise or a particular training session on a particular area of the field up into smaller numbers. The numbers right. don't really change the behavior. I think that if there's two or three in working one area of the field, that we we have more concentration and connection into the into the exercise. I think sometimes it's the onus is on us as as coaches to to encourage some discipline and and participation regardless of the number. You know, but obviously the the idea is to manage or create groups that are manageable and not large groups that are uncontrollable. 
I also would like to add that it goes with the skills of the players as well, but I mean, th th these kids have problems trapping the ball. Okay, that can slow down the exercise. So, more to what we're saying, I mean, less number of players, more, more repetition so they can actually practice and then the coaches can focus on the technical details that they need to correct. So, I'm going to do this one, two, three, four. Okay, he took a shot. Four seconds and now, if you say, okay, four seconds was the action time. Yep, but we have four players on the right side and another four players on the left side with the, with the one that shot, that is eight by four, half a minute, no, plus the dead time. That player is gonna be standing there at least for two minutes until they get back the ball again for just four seconds. Because it's, it's too much. It's not that the exercise is going in flow fast. No, the coaches are taking their time. Therefore, the dead time, it's longer. So the exercise is extremely slow. So they go back home, the players, and say, what do you practice? Oh, you know, we stop the ball and we shoot at goal. Okay, how many times do you do it? Um, I don't know. How many times do you think they can do it in, in, in how slow the exercise is going? I'm not criticizing the coaches. I'm, I'm just saying, talking about dynamic. That's all. Let's see another example of a non-dynamic non drill. Actually, this is, a, this is a good example for other things. So, as I told you, it can apply in hockey and it can apply in other things. This is more of a warm-up physical exercise. So this, I think, is a coach's seminar in India. Again, I'm not criticizing what they're doing. I think that that is fine. There's nothing wrong with what they're trying to, to accomplish to show the, the, the P teachers over there that perhaps are not uh, used to, to our sport. They're just showing them a little bit of basic footwork. But here, even in a demonstration, what is the need of having, you know, 12 players in line and, and now one is going to step on the stick, that's at that time, you see, so now, okay, now they have to go again and, and it makes the whole thing so slow. And I know it's a demonstration, but there's no, even no need in this demonstration to do it. We have a very dynamic and intense sport. There's no time in our sport for anything, basically. So having this, it kills the whole motion of everything. So we need to try to start thinking of how long of, of, of these action times and the waiting time. So let's see, one, two, three, four, I don't know, three seconds to go through this line of sticks, that's it. But now there's at least 12 players in line for a three seconds exercise. This cannot even be used as a warm up with those many players. I mean, or, or it can be used, but I think that with less people, we will get a more dynamic, a more intense exercise. Because the problem here is that all the waiting time, we give the players the time to relax, not to be necessarily focused, to talk between each other, and then we, the coaches, get upset with them because, hey, you guys are not focused. Yeah. Did we plan ahead an exercise that was dynamic and under tension enough for them not to have the chance to be unfocused? Let's see one more example. Okay, again, I don't know if the exercise is well, is bad. I, I, that, that's not my, my, my issue here. I'm not here to criticize the coach, just the dynamic of the exercise. So I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. It's a three versus two. We have four players in gray or brown on the left, five players on the right bottom. Those are the defenders and three lines of white shirt players on top of the 23 meter line. And and we have three goalkeepers. So the exercise starts now, but they still don't have the hockey ball. Now they're going to get the hockey ball, and here we go. One second, two, three, four, out. That was four seconds of action time which involves six players, including the goalkeeper, because that player as well. One player touched the ball only for four seconds. That's it. New players to come. Okay, again, I'm not judging if tactically or technically the exercise was right or wrong. That's not the problem. The problem now is that these six players involved, I don't know if the goalkeeper is going to switch, but at least the five field players, they will go back in lines. So the two defenders are going to, back, to go back to a line of four players and five players. So now, 
they are they became the input again in the line in the process so we're going to count now how long is the waiting time the individual waiting time two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve i'm going to count in silence Okay, I counted 23 seconds. I'm going to leave it in 20 to make numbers easier. So it took that last player 20 seconds to advance to one position. So now she had to wait for three more. Let's say all in all, she waited uh, one minute and 20 seconds. She's probably going to get between this last repetition plus the three, she has to wait more or less one minute, 20 seconds. So she will have to wait 1 minute 20 seconds to play for 4 seconds, 10 seconds, which is what lasted the last, the last exercise. Okay, so again, minute and 20 to wait. She might be playing, let's say, let's be nice, let's say she played 20 seconds. If you multiply this by 10 minutes of running the exercise, the action time was so slow, was so little, and the waiting time was so long. So. One of the solutions I think Stephen was saying, yes, let's break it down in more players, why not? But also let's plan ahead, let's plan ahead, let, let's think, even if we're splitting in, in smaller groups, let's, let's think about this amount of times, because if you extend it in the whole time of the training session, what lasts a training session, it's just too much sometimes the waiting time. Um, Nicolas, are you there? I don't think it's there. Let me see. Anybody wants to add something? Uh, DC. I don't know who DC is, but if you're there. Yes. Hi, it's Dmitry. DC, it's Dmitry. It's me. Hi. How are uh, you? Good, good. Thanks. Uh, I'll put my video on so at least you can see me. Um, you know, I think it comes to, you're absolutely right, it comes to how you plan, but it's also coming, uh, my point is you basically need more coaches you need someone who can help you if you're about to break this in, into the smaller groups you really have to make sure and keep this running all the time mm -hmm. you will need more help right that's my point now i i come from the in, indoor world indoor is a little bit different it's a little bit more dynamic we don't see this happening often but still I think uh, the basic idea, maybe even when you're running sessions like that, have your captains or somebody else who can come and help you out run. Like not to have just one goal and have three goalies and I'm goalie as well. And I know how it's frustrating it is as a goalie just to stay behind the goal and wait for, for my turn to come and play. So basically, basically maybe to break into the uh, half, half, of, half of the field, run a couple of more sessions, like concurrently. That's my idea. Yes, because I, I only focus in this explanation on the field players, but look at the goalkeepers. Like Yeah, they do so nothing, right? And for me as a goal, it's really frustrating sometimes. You're just standing behind and you do nothing, right? And, uh, and how many good shots you got in the first place, right? If it's a right. good shot, do I have enough practice? So for that, I, I think what I see from here, from this video, somebody should be on the other side of the field and doing the same thing, break into the two smaller groups. I have more coaches, like an assistant coach or something, who can run the session. Yeah, I, I'm going to be to be nice to the coaches and, and because perhaps they were doing this because it was just a demonstration, but even for, for this, it works because at least I've seen it uh, this mistake, I've seen it done with, with coaches that I happen to coach and I have to go and correct them. Anybody else that has any idea on how to fix this? Because you just said, okay, we need more coaches, but many times at club hockey level, we don't have any other coaches and, and we cannot take the captain because perhaps the captain needs to be, uh, to be part of the training session of that exercise. Who else can have an idea uh, that can open the microphone? Hi, I'm Thomas. Yes. Hi. 
Um, I think the, the main problem there is that they are wasting a, a lot of space. They have the whole pitch. Um, uh, yeah, you, you should like plan better your, your training session. I know that what DC was telling that you need more help will be will be great, but if you're alone, you can do it. You, know. you can do it that I don't know how to say it. <laughs> but um yeah, you can split the, the groups and do a lot of more exercise using the, the whole beach. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there were many times that I was alone in training session with, I don't know, 25 players. And perhaps you take out just, I don't know, you take um, six players and you put them between the 23-yard line and the half line. And you just tell them, you know what, three versus three with these conditions, go ahead, do it. And you perhaps don't pay a lot of attention over there because your main focus is in this drill. But you can run it more repetitions with less players and then you switch the two, the two groups. And, and that's, that's perhaps one of the solutions. Sometimes you just don't have the the human resources of coaches to to have, to have more um, people supervising. Perhaps you have don't have a lot of balls. There's so many things that can happen. But well, one of one of the things that we learn as one of the first things that we learn in the FIH Hockey Academy is that we need to be flexible because there's certain things that we cannot manage. And if we don't, we're not ready to be flexible in a training session. How are we going to be flexible to adapt ourselves to the different situations that? A hockey game can present to us. So let's go with perhaps a more well one last example. This is probably if you don't mind me coming in here. Yes, go ahead. Um, I think those kinds of training exercises is the perfect opportunity for for the training of special skills. You know, um, the opportunity to train overheads. If you just take four players out of there, you reduce time. If you take your drag figures out of there, if you take your short corner team out of there and rotate them, it's also it's a great time to to develop people, if that makes sense, while the training session is going on. You know, um, I think if we just think a little bit about the bigger picture, mm -hmm. there could be two goals in there, but there's only one. Um, yeah, so I think us as a collective are all in the same place. Can obviously see what the coach is trying to achieve, but again, how how we manage and this, we don't know what those variables are. But yeah, we we throwing around ideas, and I think it's a good time. Anything like that where it's dynamic, always time to develop specialist skills in in players. Right. No. Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree. So I'm going to show you because I was going to ask you something, but I'm going to save that question for a. Uh, and in coming up before, yeah. Maybe you can you can train the same topic in different parts of the field. Sometimes uh, you can split the group in three groups, and then you 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 train the same topics but in different situations. Right. That's another solution. Or yes. I mean, the, 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 there's some, I mean, the, there's no limit on how creative we can be. The only thing is that we need to realize when when something is killing basically the motion of the exercise of, of the exercise of the training session, and we need to be ready to to make an assessment on the on the moment and say, okay, perhaps I just let's change. I happen to to have many situations that I plan an exercise and I came to a hockey field and. The exercise was bad, and and it was not because of the players necessarily. Perhaps it was because I I planned something wrong. I failed in my planning, and I just went to the players and I was honest. You know, guys, we're going to change. I'm going to switch off this exercise. We're going to do something else. It was my fault. I saw that this exercise was going to run properly. I'm going to rethink it. We're going to go with something with the same objective, but in a different way. And that saved actually the training session before it got killed or before the players got frustrated or. I got upset with them because they were not performing it. I mean, I, we are have to be in constantly assessing ourselves. So the last exercise, this this is a, is a coach that I coach in my club in Argentina when I was there. Uh, she was just starting, so it's normal that starting coaches make mistakes like this. Uh, she was able to correct. She grew a lot in the past few years, and now I think she's a really good under 12 coach. But in in this beginning was really slow, so. There's, an ex there's a ball coming here. The girl with the gray pants picks the ball. 
the goal is somewhere else because again the tension of the exercise was so low that there was no need to be so focused and now she has to run at least I don't know 50 meters to the other side of the field collect the ball and she has to start the exercise and I know this is a little bit exaggerated but I, I've seen this in many many countries in many many places many many coaches many many levels and we make the mistake I include myself I made mistakes like this as well so Again, if you measure the action time for each player, the waiting time, the dead time, my God, and if you multiply this for how long you run this exercise, I don't know what the play, the players could be easily sitting on a chair in the middle of the field and just standing up when they need to get active. So how these kids that they are so young are going to be focused throughout 10 minutes? They can't be focused. They can't be focused. They're going to talk with each other. They're going to be thinking something else. And then they're going to make mistakes like this because they don't need to be focused. We haven't created an environment that requires for them to be intense, to be under tension. So let's go with the, with the good examples, perhaps. A few examples that I got here. So these guys, perhaps you saw them in YouTube. I love sometimes the things that they do. Um, I think they have a very deep physical educators uh, background because they come with very creative things but this is not bad I mean they are look the waiting time is almost dead for what they're trying to do which is more of a fitness coordination and technical exercise there's no waiting time the action time is high because they're constantly doing something uh, there's no dead times because they have enough equipment you see the ball went off the player collect the ball that's it we go again there's no winning time. There's no winning time. They're, they're all constantly active. And again, I, I started at the beginning saying that it's not about running 100 miles per hour at every moment of the, the exercise. It's about being under constant tension that if you get distracted for one second, you make a mistake that, it, that disrupts the whole exercise. So here, there's no chance for that. There's no chance for the players to be talking. There's no chance for anything. And again, I know that in other perhaps tactical drills, we need different pace. Okay, but this is a concept. Don't forget that. This is a concept. So let's see another one. This is a very simple passing and receiving drill. You know, we were practicing here. I was trying to accomplish with these guys just to receive between the feet, get in line with the ball, don't receive with the stick flat. I was trying to, to get them to extend the left elbow to receive. And basically, to coordinate the feet to switch from a frontal position of receiving to aiming with the left foot forward. So I could have easily put them in pairs, just passing the ball back and forth. And after two minutes, they will probably get bored because they, were, they would have been stationary just passing the ball back and forth, which is something that we do a lot when we start the training session. We tell them, okay, pair up, warm up, pass the ball around. And they start passing the ball and they talk and they do this, they do that. And we wasted five minutes of a training session in something that is not a warm up because they were just passing the ball and talking to each other. So this little exercise, which is very simple. I mean, I did it with every level of, of players, every age, and it forces them to be focused. You still accomplish the same thing. Warm up, passing the ball, push pass and receiving. That's it. But it forces them to be focused because even the third player that doesn't have the ball, that didn't pass or receive the ball, has to be focused on what's coming next. And that not only warms up the body, it warms up the head as well. Because the exercise, the warm-up exercise, has enough tension for them not to be distracted. You see, now this player killed the exercise. That time, I should have more balls over there so they can continue playing. The basic of this was, every time that a player receives the ball, there have to be two options. I mean, something simple very basic but the, 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 the objective here was to be under tension constantly let's see another one okay same group of of the australian people that i show you in the rebound exercise this is nothing bad with this instead of having two players just passing the ball back and down they have four they have to rotate if somebody messes the exercise that's it she gets exposed she, she gets exposed that she failed. So they need to be under tension constantly. They need to be focused. And this sets the pace of what's coming next. Perhaps a more complex ex exercise in your training session.
let's go with one more again very simple just a warm-up exercise this again this is a model this is a concept that we're developing so two players they just have to do a small pivot but instead of having like the exercise that I showed you before in the same turf that you see here instead of having five players in line waiting you just have two very simple the, the action time is short but the, the, the waiting time is almost none because as soon as they pass the ball they become again active so they have to be constantly active and, and under tension you give them no chance to get distracted you give them no chance to get unfocused you give them no chance to talk and that's it sets the pace of the whole training session and the last one So this is an under eight team. There was the second or the third team of the group of under eight that we had over there. Their skills are not developed yet. They're very young and you will see that their focus and attention is different than all the players. They, they just get distracted easily. But look how much they try to put effort to stay focused because the exercise demands that. I didn't need to give them any commands. I told them how the exercise was. I made sure that they knew the exercise. Once they knew the exercise, on their own they were focused i didn't need to ask them be focused they were remembering each other they were talking to each other generating communication if some player forgot to do something so very simple two white players with the ball one blue as a defender and another one white across behind the blue line the blue defender sorry so they have to pass to pass the ball on the side until the defender makes the mistakes leaves a space and you can pass it across so they start over and the passer is the one that needs to go across So she, she forgot right away that she had to get across. And the other one saw that the exercise was finished. Now she's going to forget. Now she remembers and goes across. Okay. For these kids that they were starting, basically, this was intense enough. This was demanding enough because they had to struggle to remember that they had to go across when they passed the ball forward. And also, they didn't have the skills developed enough to do it with a high with a more efficiency in terms of speed and precision but for them this was a, this was challenging enough for them to be under tension it was really challenging for them and also they were communicating with each other when somebody forgot so that was intense enough so this exercise i actually tried it as a warm-up exercise with the older players and trust me these players did it much better in terms of tension than the older players I would like to open up to see some experiences. Uh, Abel, are you there? He's there. Um, who wants to add something? Uh, let me see. Juan Manuel Gonzalez. There. Hans. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Hi, Paul. Tell me. Yes, go go ahead. If you, I'm saying like if you have something to share out of all this. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm a player from the Guatemala team. So yeah, I'm agreeing with everything that you're saying, right? That uh, for the young kids to do this drill, and sometimes when they like got confused they start talking they start laughing so they lost the focus on the on the drill right and for us the the like the national team when we do these drills it's kind of complicated as well if someone got lost the ball because we don't have that many equipment right we just work with 15 balls something like that but for for the young ones that you're saying that they have to be active and uh, don't lose the focus and develop all the other skills, I think that's really, really cool. So, okay, so you said, yeah, you, you said something about not having enough equipment, that's right? Exactly. Okay. I mean, don't, what do you think? I mean, that, that, does, does it necessarily be that for not having equipment, you, you can, the coaches should not run a dynamic training session? No, how, how would you like, drive a, a dynamic session like how would you like do this with less equipment 
So it can okay. be as good as the ones that are with a lot of equipment, like the normal, the okay. average equipment. Does anybody have any ideas or, or suggestions? So the situation is, we don't have enough equipment. How do we still run a, a dynamic training session that necessarily, I would like to add, doesn't necessarily mean let's play a, a scrimmage game, just seven versus seven. I think, uh, Pablo, it's Dimitri. I think the very first sample that you showed us, the very first video was a good video, how you can get around this issue, right, this problem because you're actually showing dynamic exercise and then you have someone who just does the ladder and just jumping. Yes, this th that one, yes. I think it's a this very one. good exercise, yep. This one, yes. Because okay, you have different things here. You have a physio and you have somebody playing with the ball. I think it's a very good sample of how you can make this dynamic enough because you're mixing matching and they're moving all the time. Okay, but... What, what, what would you suggest if we, let's say, same exercise, same amount of people, but we only have three balls? Yes, yes, exactly. That, that's what I mean, because they do different things here. Yeah. And you know, not necessarily you need a ball when you start jumping into the, the ladder, all this kind of stuff, right? So you don't need yeah. much equipment. No, no, I agree. But, okay, but th this is one exercise. The, the question that he had was, Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Juan. Question is, how do you run a whole training session with, with, with more complex exercises or more complex objectives, perhaps, if you don't have enough equipment? Exactly. What's that? Yeah. Juan, do you have any idea, suggestions? There? No, I don't think it's there. Okay, I'm going to give you what, what happened to me. I mean, it's just, it's just planning. There, there's nothing else you can do. I mean, I, there, I don't think that there's one solution that can tell you, okay, in this situation, do this or do that. It's, it's planning ahead. It's planning ahead. Okay, so you don't have enough balls to do what you expected to do before. Well, uh, I don't know, uh, split the group in two, get some group doing, perhaps doing some fitness thing or, or playing something, I don't know, send them play three versus three focus on the main part of the, the exercise that you want to accomplish and then switch the groups because in the end at least you will have them doing something uh, but I know that if you do a shooting exercise with not enough balls well um, let okay sorry I'm going to I, I just on top of my head sorry this exercise okay you have to shoot at goal and you only have three balls and you have uh, six players involved well before this, the, before the last part, the, the, the action that is just shooting at goals, I don't know, have them passing the ball in, in certain patterns until you get the last part of the exercise uh, extended. I mean, include more people involved into the exercise. So at least if you don't have enough balls, at least you have more people doing something throughout the exercise in different stations. I think okay. somebody was talking over there. Or it was you? No, I just say okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's, let's go on. So here comes the, the, the other thing. I mean, I, I'm I just including this model more problems that sometimes the coaches face. So here you had four people waiting, one returning to the exercise and one executing the exercise. What happens if all of a sudden three more players or four more players join in the, ex the line? It's even worse because the action period, the action period is still, still the same, 10 seconds, but the waiting time now, it became 10 by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, nine people. That's one minute and a half. So for the same amount of the action time, which was 10 seconds, now you have to wait one minute and 30 seconds, which was basically the exercise that we saw, the three versus two. And then what you were guys saying before, we don't have enough equipment. What do we do now? How do we solve this situation? Because the one minute and a half waiting, 10 minutes executing, and now the dead time has increased. And sometimes even worse, we get, we, we, we as coaches, we say, we're going to talk a lot and we start talking and we start explaining and we pause the exercise every two seconds because we see something that we want to correct and we're so eager to fix that. And the exercise is slower, it's slower, it's slower because we as coaches are making it slower. 
we saw the example. So here's the question, which after speaking so much, uh, between after you guys actually saying things, I think it became rhetorical. Who should be generating the intensity, the players or, or the coaches? Sorry, I had a question before here. Somebody sent me a private question. I am trying to find it. Uh, where do I find the question? Okay, I'm going to answer that one later. Um, so, guys, the question is, who's responsible for this and what? Should the players should be the ones that are focused all the time, even if we don't present something that needs, or are asked the coaches? Where's the limit between the responsibility between the coaches or the players? What do you guys think? Anthony, how are you? Can you hear us? Hi, hi, yes, hi, how are you? Hi. Good, how are you? I'm all right, this is Steve. This is Anthony, this is one also one of the 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 ones that are running these uh, webinars for the Pan Am Hockey Federation. Anthony, how are you? Um, the question is this, um, who should be responsible to generate intensity and the focus, the players or the coaches? I think we as coaches have to be responsible for that and, and, and how we how we set up um, the training to increase intensity, as, as we know. Um, <clears throat> uh, smaller spaces create uh, more intensity, so I think it's up to us to create that. Um, I think once we do have the right settings, the players will then have the intensity that we would like. As well. Okay, but sometimes even we do our things the players are still not not their focus i mean i think that sometimes also there's a limit that the players don't are not focused for some reason but of course i agree that we need to generate this so i'm going to go back to the to, i didn't realize that i wasn't sharing my screen on the powerpoint so what i said before was okay this exercise with four players waiting one executing one coming back to the line all of a sudden we found out that we have more players than we expected. So now we have nine players in line, sorry, three, six, eight players in line, one executing and me returning to the line. So the waiting time becomes longer because now I have to wait 10 seconds by nine. So that's a minute and a half and I'm still just playing for 10 seconds. And now what you guys said before, if we don't have enough equipment, we don't have enough balls or the dead time. The coach decided to make corrections every two seconds because he sees the correction fine, but he just or she talks too much. Now the exercise, the waiting time is even longer. And if we multiply that for the amount of time during a training session, perhaps we realize that the players didn't play enough with the ball. And then they failed because they didn't practice enough. They weren't practice, but doesn't mean that they were practicing. So here's the, 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 the slide. Who should be the one generating intensity, players or coaches? Anybody to add something, guys? Go ahead. I think I didn't that's hear it. A... Yes. Yeah, I'm back. Um, I think you have two possibilities or two cases here. If we you train a, a young team, I think that the coach or the trainer is the responsible to to make. Um, To generate an intensity, and then if you train a, a first team or a team, I think the players are the, the responsible for that. Yeah, so like uh, as you grow up, the, the, the commitment to put it somehow yeah. it should go up as well. Yeah, for my experience. I train kids and train uh, the, the uh, first team or men's teams, and I have the I have the experience like that. When you train kids, you have to uh, put full energy to generate in, uh, this uh, this intensity, and when you go up with the other team, uh, it's different. Uh, I agree. Could it also be that, because what you were saying that, I was thinking, could it be that also, I mean, when you are older, if you were able to reach certain age that you say, okay, I'm doing this because I really want to be here, 
I'm going to, to do it because perhaps the, the objective that I have now is something else. Or perhaps it's becoming, making it to a first team or perhaps, I don't know, being part of a national team or winning the league. Uh, and so your commitment is higher because you already made up your mind that you like doing this. So you have the responsibility, I agree. And perhaps when you're younger, these younger players perhaps are still deciding between continuing in hockey or doing something else. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I, I agree. Uh, I would like to hear a little bit from the ladies in the group. I see in the list I, we have a Laura, Mechi. I don't know if we have anybody else. Well, what do you guys, do you have any experience? What, what do you think about all this that we've been talking? I, I don't agree a lot. Uh, the thing that when you are like older, only the, the hockey player is the one that has to be like putting the energy to the training session. Uh, in my experience as a player, I had like gr really good um, coaches and they were like so energetic that the session was like awesome. Mm -hmm. And I had like other coaches that they weren't as, um, as energetic or uh, as clever, I don't know how to, uh, what word to use, but the session was so boring or the exercise was so slow and the way, maybe it's more important, the way that he, um, he, he spoke in the, in the training session, you see? If he was like, uh, like, slow, like a slow person or, I don't know how to say it in English. My my English is not that good. You're, you're going well. I, I, I understand everything. You, you understand? <laughs> yes, yes. Like it's, the it's, way well. the you're way that great. the way that my coaches um, try to explain the exercise or the way they move in the training session for me is um, the the come on, you're glad. The key <laughs> to make like a great session. You see. I so um, I, I don't know if the when you are like an, an older guy or if you got like a training experience or you are in the first team, I, I think that the, the coach is like really, really important the way no, that I, he moves in the, in the, in the training session. I, I agree with, with, with the two things that were said before, um, but I have to say that I believe that the coach, I mean, we are the coaches here, right? Even if mm -hmm. some of you are players, but we're thinking as coaches. So at least in my case, I always try to think, what did I do wrong to make this so bad? So I have to, to assess myself. Of course, there's some things that you can say, okay, perhaps something else is going on with the players and I need to go to the players and talk to them and get the feedback from them to say, okay, why did this fail? But yes, in this case, we're talking about what we as coaches can do to affect the training session into becoming, to making it more dynamic and intense. So yes, um, I think that there's a responsibility from the players, but there's a full responsibility from the coaches. Yeah. But I, I yeah. think that what, what Juan was saying more was like, okay, when you get older, and of course you need the coach to still have the same responsibility of providing the intensity of the training session, but also when you get older as a player, you are a more committed player into the sport and you say, okay, you know, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. When you're a kid, perhaps you need to engage them differently. I, I don't think that is more about being uh, more engaged as a coach. I think perhaps it could be different because it comes to next. How long does it take to generate a first impression? You can Google this. There's many studies about this and many people study about how long it takes to generate the first, first impression, but all in all, in average, they say seven seconds, most of the universities or studies over there say seven seconds so seven seconds you show up to a training session with your hands in your pocket or with one hand in your pocket the other one in your phone that's it what dynamic are you going to ask to the to the players the player can read you can easily read you you arrive eating you arrive not dressed properly uh, i mean not dressed properly i mean you you are not dressed for for a training session you come with your tie and shirt from work yeah, sometimes we don't have the chance because we go straight from work to a training pitch, but get a bag and change. Don't, don't, don't show up like that because the players are going to read you. And even though you're doing the effort to be on time, it's not professional enough. And 
professionalism is not about getting paid for doing this, it's about the way you execute what you're doing. Um, so again, the players can read you in seven seconds. If you all go there and you start, as you were saying before, I think it was a very good point. You start talking slow and, you know, let's do this, and you take to start the exercise. And while they're doing the exercise, you, you're replying to text messages on your phone, and I've seen that a lot. That's it. What, what, what you're going to demand from the players? And the worst thing is that then some coaches demand from the players, even though they do these things. And that's when negative situations are arise. Because, simple, why would I do something if you are not leading with the example? You are the coach, you are the leader of the team. And yes, we have to be responsible because we decided to be here in training sessions, but you also lead the training session. So I agree with what was said before as well. So I wrote a few things that I would like again to open up a little bit more the, the conversation. At least five topics that I think the coaches should have, which is arrive on time. Sometimes we, we arrive late for a specific situation that can happen. can always be arranged. You know, you call the captain, you look, start warming up. I have an issue at work. I have a problem with my family. Doesn't matter, but when it becomes a pattern, it becomes something extremely negative. And I know that for some of you in certain uh, countries or clubs, or this is not an issue, but it does happen. It does happen when it becomes a pattern. It's it's bad. Be prepared for the session, as I told you before. Be dressed for the for what you're going to do. Uh, come with the material that you, with the equipment that you that you need. Um, plan in advance because it's easy to see when somebody improvises. You don't need to be an experienced player or an experienced coach to detect when somebody's just improvising something out of the top of the head and say, you know what, let's do this with the cones here and this. so that they, they know in advance. Or when, when again, the same exercise over and over and over and over and you the players start feeling that they don't progress because we don't plan in advance. And also plan in advance with the time constraint that I showed you before. So the exercise has that level of demand that the players need to be tense at all time. Show energy and concentration and verbal and non-verbal communication. I think it was Lara who said this. You had coaches that were intense and energetic and you had amazing training sessions while you had coaches that were not that intense and you had bad training sessions. Uh, and sometimes even good coaches with no energy make really slow training sessions and sometimes the other way around. So we need to balance that. Uh, Mechi? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Any anything to add? Please go ahead. No, no, that that, that was the, the thing what I was trying to talk <laughs> about. Like the way that the trainer, the coach, um, makes the um, the training session uh, is like really really important. And those things that you have just said, the ones that um, being on time and prepare the session. They are also that those things. Yeah. Anthony, anything from your side that the coach should have, perhaps? Yeah, um, I agree with, with all the points uh, made, but I also think it doesn't matter to me on what ages the individuals are. I think they still would like to have fun, and it doesn't matter the professionalism or whatever. And us as coaches still have to put some element of fun into the exercise for the athletes to actually want to produce that energy and um, produce that want to train. Yes, uh, as a professional, there are certain you know, things that you would want in your mind as an athlete to want to achieve and want to be successful in, and that drives certain people. Um, but there are some people that just, you know, it, it helps to have that fun element somewhere inside. I'm not saying that the drill has to be a childish drill or whatever the situation is. I'm just saying somewhere in it has to have that fun. And sometimes that fun, as someone was saying, is rightfully the coach's attitude. And he was saying that, that coach's attitude, that energy, that, you know, that, that, that understanding as, you know, we in, all this, we in this together. And, and to me, those points are critical, but I think we, we forget that element of fun still, don't matter the age, that we have to create that fun element for the athletes still. So, so. But I agree with all that you said. Yeah. Okay. Um, Abel, Benja, who else? David, I mean, guys that, that didn't speak yet, Diego, if you want to, to join in, share your experience, Federico, Franco. If not, we, we continue. Or the ones that spoke before, if you guys want to add something. 
David. Okay, I just go on. So, what do we plan? What is the difference between a PE class and training for competition? Is there any difference between a PE class and a training for competition? Juan Manuel or Juane, you guys were active. Steven? Uh, I think, yeah. uh, oh, oh, yeah. go ahead, David, <laughs> sorry. Um, to me, maybe a PE class would be more instruction based about uh, techniques and exercises that way. If you're training for competition, be more tactical would, would come into that as well. Who was Juan Manuel? Oh, yeah, I was going to say that the PE is like for development of the kids, right? To start, um, I don't know how to say, motricia, like to make ex exercises, right? But for a competition, you have to prepare for that event. So everything's focused on that event, uh, the, where it's going to be, how many teams are going to be. And it's like uh, you had to prepare more for that than for a PE class, I think. Yeah, I, I raised this question because um, in, in some many many countries, the the school after after I mean in, in PE classes they perhaps practice hockey and then if they choose to continue playing hockey or doing more competitively they join the club which is generally um, after school hours school hours. But again, we're talking about the coaches, so should be there a difference between the p class plan and the coaching session for competition and i'm going to to, to share my experience uh, we can easily detect i mean in my experience coaching coaches we can easily detect the coach that is also a PE teacher but doesn't make the break between the school and the competitive club and one of the things that we detect a lot of times is that what do you plan when you are competing? So you have a game on Saturday and you go do the feedback session after the match. You get the feedback from the players. We did this well, we did this wrong. You give them the feedback to them and you agree. Okay, you know what? We failed coming out of the 16 yard line because I don't know. We fail on the technical aspect of the receiving under pressure and also tactically we didn't move well. Good. Okay. You get that information that is so valuable because the players and yourself are saying just after the game, we fail here, let's work on these things. Or we did this well, let's do something more complex, let's let's go explore an air alternative. So you got the information. What happens generally, and I'm not saying everybody, but the coach that doesn't make the switch between P class and competitive training session. We go to a training session for the competitive team and we do exercises that are just comfortable because we know how to run them. They are not necessarily the ones that we need to improve the team for competition. So we run the training session. Oh, very good training session. Yes, we did this exercise, we did this one, blah, blah, blah. Okay, how is that going to help you to win on Saturday? Well, yeah, we did training session. Okay, did you connect with the feedback that you receive on Saturday? to the training sessions to improve on next Saturday or not. So that in my mind is something that I've seen a lot with coaches that would, that are not able to, to switch the two profiles between PE class and training sessions. Or, or another one, I mean, this, this is very personal perhaps. Some of the, the, the coaches that coach PE classes and training sessions but don't break the difference between the two of them, uh, they still call themselves the teacher in PE class, fine. But training session in club is not a teacher, it's a coach. So it's very little and subtle uh, things and definitions. And I'm not saying it's bad, I'm saying that I think, in my opinion, in my personal experience, there's two different profiles for the players and the training session that we have to, to run. Uh, what do you guys think? Hi, Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, David. Um, I think it's very important in in coaching players or 
even young players or adult players. Uh, when you train for a competition, it's very important to give challenge to the player, some challenge and and train in the desire to win and to solve situations also. Uh, maybe I'm not a PE teacher, so I don't want to say anything about the, uh, the PE teachers, but I think in my experience as a, as a young kid going to schools, simple as that, uh, you work more, more on the technique and basic drills, and I think it's very important to challenge your players uh, and make them solve situations to train for a competition. I think that's a very big difference that you can notice between the school and a competition club. Yeah, because also I didn't, I, I explained in one direction, I explained the other direction. I happen to have in some PE class, for example, in my, in my school in Argentina, uh, part of PE class was for us to play rugby. And because I was a hockey player, I was fit enough compared to some of the other uh, students that were not doing any sports. So they put me in the rugby team and I didn't like it. I promise you, I didn't like it a lot. I didn't enjoy it. But we had a coach that was a really good club coach. He was actually in the national team of, of Argentina. He was one of the big guys. He was a really good coach. But there were many people, I mean, I ended up enjoying because I enjoy every sport. I didn't like particularly rugby to play at club, but you know, but there were some of the students that didn't like anything at all of, of even moving around. So, yeah, that, that the demand of the club in the PE class was also not uh, positive for the PE class environment. Mm -hmm. Sorry, David, you were going to say something. Yeah, so um, I think the difference and obviously it's different in context from country to country. Um, in okay. South Africa, we, we kind of use PE as the, the health benefit and encourage activity and it's also a basis of introducing sport you know so introducing various sporting codes to to the broader base of, of students so how you incorporate that with your first team player at the same time I'd, I'd like to think that you can never go wrong with basics but as a PE coach who is also a hockey coach it's quite important to be able to step it up in a training session and use your key competencies at, at another level, at a higher level from P class to training session, especially in competition phases. So, so we're talking about two different levels, P and competitive, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay, and the last part is connected to this. And again, I would like you guys to, to answer this one. Um, anybody just open up your mic and let's go ahead. At what age should we start training to achieve victories? Is it wrong to promote a competitive spirit? What do you guys think? Um, I would say that um, long-term athletic development indicates that at age 14 and up is where you begin to get competitive in the sense of looking at results. Um, as opposed to the ages before. So long-term athlete development will indicate that before that, you know, there are no winners and losers, more of just um, being able to play and enjoy the sport, et cetera. And afterwards at 14 and up, then we begin to get into that mode of um, becoming as a competitive, you know, 13, 14 to be that way. Um, just one question from me, um, um, Pablo, from, the, from before. Um, where we have schools that, uh, yes, we have PE, but then there's this school league where these schools compete in the league in a school competition. How do you differentiate training them for that or as opposed to training in the club system? What, what, is, the, what is the difference that uh, uh, we might look at? This is just me looking at the whole competition. Um, is there a difference in how you will train for a school competition as opposed to you know, in a club uh, um, situation? Well, I, I personally understand very well this question because, you, I mean, you come from a place similar to what I experienced when I was in Barbados for four years, that the school, we had the PE classes in school, and then afterwards we had, in the, in the afternoon, we had the training sessions for the school teams that were going to compete in the school league. Is that right? Yes, yes, correct. Okay. Yes. So in the PE class, I had many, many, many students 
that were part of they, they would play hockey cricket football you know they were rotating athletics mm -hmm. so i tried to do back then and we tried to do in that class i think that's something similar as was david was saying we try to do something recreational introduce them to the sport the basic of the sport see if we could make them fall in love with hockey for them to make a bigger commitment that was to come in the afternoons let's go to the hockey turf and there we switch it up uh we will we will do something you know, slowly generating that pace. And unfortunately, sometimes we lost some of the players because they said, okay, you know what? I like hockey in school, but I don't like to come in the afternoon for this type of training session because I know it's more intense. You're, I mean, this in their mind, their kids, okay? I'm, I'm trying to, to think the way they were thinking in, in, a, in a moral way. Uh, this requires more, more intensity or more commitment than just, you know, in the afternoon, I prefer to go no, do, do art or music or something else. Okay, no problem. But uh, in the afternoon, I mean, I, without, without changing the way we, we, we are, without changing our way to communicate to the players or with the respect, just switching up the intensity and, and easily they start filtering out, unfortunately. But, uh, but if not, you, you just are going to affect negatively the competitive part of the, of the club, or sorry, the competitive part of the team within the school. What, what else? Any, any other opinion, guys, about this part, about what age should we start training to achieve victories? Pablo, I would, um, I'd like to think the moment you start playing 1v1, you start developing a competitive mindset in the individual. You know, for competition, it's, it's a little bit different, but developing that competitive mindset is a little, a little bit earlier. You know, if you're doing 1v1 from the age of seven and team competition from under 12 from regional perspectives, you'd start finding the, the meaning of winning and losing. Not that it's important, but the meaning of winning and losing. You know, because I think knowing how to lose and knowing how to win is all part of develop, the development of, of the player. Steven, what do you think? Um, it's trying to it's trying to get the the balance between development and and getting a, as David was saying there a one in, a one in mentality as well. Um, I think probably one of the sometimes the worst example that I see is in, in youth football um, where coaches and you kind of children that are seven or eight years old and and for them they have to get a win as well um, a lot of the time and it's a one at all costs which isn't good. Um, but you do need, I think you do need to, to get a, a one in culture if you're bringing, bringing children through in, in club sport. Um, when you start developing that, um, I don't know, nine, 10, 11 years old. Um, but you know, children, children want to be, they, they want to be competitive. Um, there's a lot of times you see leagues and competitions where there's no scores kept. The, the kids know the scores in games and, and it drives them on. Um, so, to me, you know, once they in, in Ireland here, once they leave, they leave primary school. Then, you know, the competition's there, and they want to, they want to push on. So, from from under twelve, um, they they step and they play for, they represent their schools, they represent their clubs, um, and they get into a competitive environment. Um, so it is it's important to get the balance, the the development from an early age. Um, but I, I think uh, you have to have that that one in mentality and culture too. Yep, Matty. What do you think? Mm, uh, the other guy uh, said it before. Um, I think that the competition in the kids, uh, it's always there. But the important thing is how they take the winning time and, the, and when they lose. Um, when you see little kids uh, when they are running to come to the sessions. And if they are two kids, they are going to like look uh, the other guy and they are going to make that uh, running a race because they like to compete. It's it's fun. Um, I think that the, the important thing is how they take when you lose and uh, and how they take it when you when they win. And I think the coach there is like uh, another guy important in the way that they are going to take when they lose or when they win. Yeah, I mean, and also parents. <laughs> I mean. Let, let, let's put it this way: If you ask any kid in any sport or even a school, let, let, let's uh, a school, how was the test? Oh, they will tell you uh, it was difficult, but I scored well. 
or it was difficult by yeah. school, but they're competing against themselves and they're competing against the uh, other one. The kids, they download a, a, a game on their phone and they're competing. Competitive, competitiveness is, is in our spirit. I think mm -hmm. the, the, hiding that there's no competition and, and everybody's nice, you know what, it's fine, but we cannot hide something that is in our nature, nature is, and it's in our nature of the sport. You ask a kid right after the game, how was the game? I had fun, but we lost. Or I had fun and we won. They tell you that. We cannot erase that. I think it's more important how we administrate the defeats yeah. and also how we administrate the values towards achieving a victory. Uh, Juane, are you there? Juane? Okay, the, the, the story that I want to, to talk about is that Juan and I, we come both from Buenos Aires. We come from the, the, the derby of Argentina in hockey, which is San Fernando Mitre. And I am sure that in his club, as well as in my club, as soon as you get, doesn't matter what, what age you start hockey over there, even if you start five years old, first thing you tell you is the rival is Mitre or the rival is San Fernando. And it happens, and we enjoy that because we enjoy competition. But at least in my experience, the most important thing I received was that the feedback from the coach on saying, hey, let's see how we administrate the, the way we lost, let's see how we administrate the way we won. But taking away the, the competition part of the, of the sport is something that it can't happen because it's in their nature. We need to know how to administrate and how to add intensity. Anthony. Anthony? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm almost finished and out of time. If you want to wrap up the session. Well, um, I, I think um, I think the topic is, is quite interesting. I think the, the values inside um, of what is being said and with the participants' um, responses, I think you guys really had an a, a interesting conversation and, and hearing the different cultures um, of how people look at stuff. Uh, I think is most important for us is about that, what you said about planning as coaches. Um, and we know that there's a cycle in that. There's the plan, the do, and the review. Uh, and therefore, we must always be looking at what we did the last time to try and do better as coaches in our planning. Um, so for me, uh, I think that that was, that was great. Um, I really like the interaction with everyone else. Uh, I kind of got to learn different cultures and different ways of thinking um, in certain situations. So this is good. Uh, but I think the information was valid and, and, and a very good presentation. Well done. Yep. Thank you, Anthony, for being there. Um, I look forward to participating in your next time. I wasn't for the last time there. but um, And I would like to thank you, everybody, because in the end, we, we had a, a hockey conversation. And it was good to, to hear from everybody again, as Anthony said, for, with different backgrounds, different competitive styles, and, and I think that that is a way to, to learn better than if I would have been talking for an hour and a half that I would have got bored as well. So it was very nice for everybody that participated. Laura? Thank you, Pablo. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, guys, for being part of this webinar. And stay tuned with our social media that more webinars will come. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a okay, good day. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you.